Anxiety is a hydra. It shapeshifts. It is insidious. It invades every cell of the psyche. Anxiety is like slow acting poison, permeating every membrane, every defense, every behavior, every cognition, and every emotion cause, causes cognitive distortions, such as catastrophizing. And it leads inexorably to comorbidities or dual diagnosis such as depression. Anxious people have a constricted life. They're trying to avoid the triggers of anxiety. And in doing so, they're limiting themselves to lives which are more and more narrow, less and less, and less lived. And this, of course, brings on depression and worse. Anxiety is closely associated with multiple mental health, mental health dysfunctions. For example, hyposexuality. Anxiety reduces the sex drive, the libido, to the point of vanishing. Anxiety is also closely associated with psychopathy. Yes, most psychopaths are anxious. Look it up on my channel. There are two videos at least dedicated to correcting the misconception that psychopaths are not anxious and are fearless. And so anxiety is really, really bad for you. And I said that it shapeshifts. So for example, phenomena which don't look at all like anxiety are anxiety. Examples, vaccine, intuition, hypervigilance. And this is today's topic, intuition and hypervigilance as examples, as forms of anxiety. My name is Sam Vaknin, as you might have guessed by now, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. I'm also a professor of psychology to the detriment of my poor students, who are all, without a single exception, anxious, anxious, <laughs> hypervigilant, and trying desperately to use their intuition to understand the mad professor who is teaching them. All right, Shoshanim, let's delve right in. Anxiety, as I said, is when you feel unpleasant for no discernible, clear, and good reason. You can't, you can't put your finger on anything. You can't pinpoint a threat out there. You do feel menaced. You do feel there is an ominous feeling but you don't know why, and you can't explain and communicate it to other people. Clinically, anxiety is a form of compounded or complex emotion, but it derives from a cognitive, cognitive distortion or even cognitive deficit known as catastrophizing. Anticipatory anxiety, which is a variant, a very common variant of anxiety, is built on catastrophizing you anticipate the worst you imagine bad things that are going to happen some people defend against catastrophizing by developing compulsions and obsessions hence obsessive compulsive disorder others defend against catastrophizing by by developing a state of internal arousal like they are preparing themselves the muscles are tense the heart is beating, pumping more blood, and you are wide awake and alert, expecting bad, horrible things to happen and ready for the fight. This state of hyperarousal is another name for anxiety. And it's easy to see that someone is anxious, is nervous, is uh, uh, pacing back and forth. He, is, he has somatic complaints. He is ruminating, she is twitching, ticks. I mean, anxiety is easily discernible and anxiety is infectious. As, as organisms, we are built to communicate to each other an imminent looming threat. Anxiety is perceived by everyone around the anxious person 
is a warning sign, is an alert, is an alarm. And so people around the anxious person tend to become anxious as well. It's contagious. It's as if they were saying, he must know something that we don't know, because otherwise, why is he anxious? Why is he uneasy? Why is he worried? But they don't realize that all these, the worry, the unease, the catastrophizing, are diffuse. They are not focused. They are an overreaction to a situation that is usually totally imaginary. All these phenomena, the muscular tension, the restlessness, the fatigue, the breathlessness, the tightness in the abdomen, abdominal region, the nausea, problems in concentration, sudden, sudden crying, all these have to do more with an internal, an internal scenario that is unfolding in the mind rather than with anything external. Anxiety resembles fear, but it is not fear. Fear is rational. It's a reaction to a, to a real um, threat, immediate or perceived. It's a flight or fight response. Um, anxiety involves dread. Kierkegaard wrote about it at length. Anxiety involves dread. Fear doesn't involve dread. Fear mobilizes, anxiety paralyzes. People with fear usually try to construct defenses or tackle the source of the fear somehow. People with anxiety usually withdraw and isolate themselves and become, as I said, totally paralyzed. And so there are multiple forms of anxiety disorder. I just, I, as I opened the, uh, the opening of the video, and we need to look around us at human behaviors and human choices and human traits and so on, and realize that many, many of them have to do with, with anxiety. Consider, for example, gut feeling. Gut feeling is immediate, but it's nebulous. If I, if I were to ask you to verbalize and analyze your gut feeling, you would have a problem. Very few people can do that. Actually, no one can do that. Gut feeling is exactly this. It's something that takes place in the gut rather than in the brain. And so gut feeling is an anxiety reaction. Even intuition is an anxiety reaction. It takes longer than gut feeling to form. It feels more precise, <clears throat> more incisive, more certain, more analytical, but actually it's not. Intuition, similar to gut feeling, is very, very fuzzy. It cannot be pinned down. It cannot be properly algorithmically analyzed. In this sense, it's an anxiety reaction. Both gut feelings and intuition, exactly like anxiety, feed on bodily inputs. Both of them somehow interact with the body and derive information from the body, which is crucial for the formation of gut feelings and intuitions. The sensor, the sensory inputs are only one part of it. Autonomous reactions, such as heartbeat or perspiration, also figure into the equation and the formation of gut feelings and intuitions, exactly as they do in anxiety. People with an elevated heart rate would tend to become anxious, trying to explain to themselves why their hearts are beating faster. As we try to make sense of these corporeal data, we often come up with a heuristic or some kind of narrative. And most of the time, we perceive the outcomes of these attempts as gut feelings or intuitions. So there's a body-mind axis in play, which is very common in all types of anxiety reactions. And exactly like most in most cases of anxiety, intuition is wrong as often as it is right. It is a shaky foundation for decision-making, but it is a reliable signal that further research and investigation are called for. I've made another video on this channel where I'm telling you, where I told you that when you come across a narcissist and the psychopath, 
Very often you're going to have a very strong, overwhelming even, gut feeling or intuition that something is wrong. Stop. Disengage. Study the issue. Investigate it further. Be careful. Exercise caution. Intuition should not be confused with either emotions or cognitions. Intuitions are amalgams of both. In, of both. In other words, intuitions contain emotions and cognitions, exactly like any other type of anxiety. But intuitions are a form uh, of, anxi of anxiety that has to do with hypervigilance. I will, I will discuss it in a minute. We should listen to gut feelings and we should listen to intuitions. They're telling us that something has gone awry with the way that we perceive reality. And this alert bears careful investigation and research, of course. But I would not act on my intuition or gut feeling unless and until I have delved deeper into what it is that is nagging at me. Intuitions and gut feelings are a poor guide in the sense that um, they can't, they are not good at telling you what to do instantly. But intuitions and gut feelings direct you to invest some effort in trying to reach this certainty of action. Because as I said, as often or not, intuitions and gut feelings turn out to have been wrong. They involve catastrophizing. And some intuitions are even delusional. But, but, in some of the cases, about half the cases actually, they do signal that you're misperceiving reality, that there's a lurking, lurking something. It doesn't have to be danger, but something is out there. Something is out there, and you need to find out what. Now, when, it, when intuition and gut feelings, intuitions and gut feelings, are recurrent, repetitive, frequent, etc., we have a, con a condition called hypervigilance. It's when we inaccurately filter sensory information, when we are in a state of enhanced sensory sensitivity. It's kind of a dysregulation of the nervous system, if you wish, and it's very common after trauma or in, within post-traumatic stress disorder. And so these stress signals, they, they trigger defense mechanisms and also involve catastrophizing, dangerous, perceived, which are real or imagined. And so hypervigilance is a state of chronic dysregulation, chronic release of stress signals and signaling molecules and hormones, and disproportionate inappropriate reactions to this constant signaling, a reaction known as anxiety and sometimes intuition and sometimes gut feeling. And this, of course, is very exhausting, this abnormally increased arousal, a high responsiveness to stimuli, a constant scanning of the environment for imminent or imminent catastrophes, imminent calamities. There's a perpetual scanning because the hypervigilant person tries desperately to extract information from sights, sounds, smells, people, behaviors, locations, any, any piece of information, any type of activity, any, because the hypervigilant person has learned to connect, to associate, uh, change, evolution, um, environmental cues with trauma and with threats. This kind of individual is on high alert because he believes unconsciously that danger is always near and always imminent. He, he acts obsessively in, in clinical terms. Hypervigilance is not the same as a flashback or in clinical terms, revividness or dysphoric hyperarousal. It's not the same as a, as a flashback. In in hypervigilance, the person remains co cogent and aware of the surroundings. He is not, he doesn't lose touch with reality. In dysphoric hyperarousal, in true flashback, 
there's a loss of contact with reality and a total re-experiencing of the traumatic event. So there's a big, a big difference between, between the two. Hypervigilance is a symptom of PTSD and other forms of anxiety disorders, but it's not the same as paranoia. It's not the same as schizophrenia, etc., etc. People uh, with hypervigilance simply scan the environment all the time for possible threats or, in the case of narcissists, for possible insults or narcissistic injuries. They overreact and they overreact to various triggers. It could be, I don't know, a loud noise or they have, in other words, what we call startle responses. They have a difficult time to regulate various processes such as, such as for example, going to sleep. So they often suffer from insomnia. And in many people, this condition, this state of hypervigilance can last decades, absolutely decades. And they can't tolerate their environment anymore and they withdraw, they avoid, they become avoidant. And they are very, very depleted and exhausted. Intuition and gut feeling, when they become the template or the foundation for decision making, always lead to hypervigilance. And in any case, all these phenomena are interconnected because they all involve catastrophizing and they're all forms of anxiety. I hope this lecture hasn't made you too anxious and that you have not become hypervigilant with my videos, dear students. See you later. And that's not a promise. That's a threat. And you can safely catastrophize on it.